assassination of President Sadat reminds one of the role of guns and bullets in our political life. David Broder, who was one of Vernon's classmates in the Institute of Politics Fellows Group of 1960, wrote a rather troubling column this past weekend on what might have been. Looking back at the assassination of President John Kennedy and what might have been, or Robert Kennedy and what might have been, Martin Luther King to President Reagan if in fact he had been killed, or the Pope if he had been killed, or more recently to Mr. Sadat. I think it's a troubling uh, set of reflections and I think for uh, many of uh, Vernon's oldest friends here, we're uh, pleased to have him still with us and trust that he'll be with us for a long time to come. The Pollock Lectures were established at Harvard more than 30 years ago. They were a gift of Leo Silver and are dedicated to the memory of Gustav Pollock, a distinguished author and journalist of the early 1900s. In fact, Gustav Pollock's granddaughter, Mrs. Victor Jones, is here with us this evening, and we're very pleased to have her here. This is an annual event, the purpose of which is to bring to the Kennedy School individuals who will, according to the terms of the gift, stimulate interest in government careers and research with a view toward building a better government, close quote. Vernon's predecessors include Billy Brant, Pat Harris, Jim Schlesinger, and Lord Trin. This year's Pollock Lecturer is Vernon Jordan, who, a man whom even Time Magazine has said, quote, is one of the great unifying forces in the country today. Vernon is a distinguished veteran of the Long March, the struggle for civil rights and racial equality, which George Will rather accurately described here last week as, quote, the most significant initiative in American politics in the 20th century. Of this struggle, Vernon's career is exemplary. A civil rights lawyer and an NAACP organizer in the Deep South during the early 60s, he not only led countless boycotts and demonstrations, but he physically as well as legally helped desegregate the University of Georgia. Later, as director of the Voter Education Project of the Southern Regional Council, he coordinated a campaign that permanently changed the political face of the South. From 1964 to 1968, under Vernon's leadership, some two million new black voters were registered, fueling a nearly eightfold increase in the number of black elected officials. In 1970, Vernon was named executive director of the United Negro College Fund. Two years later, he succeeded the late Whitney Young as head of the National Urban League, a post he has held ever since, and will continue to hold until the end of the year, when after 10 years of service, he will step down to pursue a private law practice. Vernon is certainly no stranger to Harvard or to this school. He was a fellow of the Institute of Politics, as I mentioned, in 1969. He served since then as a member of the school's visiting committee and a member of the advisory committee of the Institute of Politics. He's a frequent visitor at the school and a trusted counselor. And indeed, he, seemed, he is one of those rare individuals who so distinguished themselves in the outside world without the benefit of a Harvard degree that Harvard felt it necessary to designate him one of its own by awarding him an honorary degree in 1978 adding to some 30 honor, other honorary degrees he's received. So it's a great pleasure to welcome back an old friend here tonight to speak to us as the 1981 Pollock Lecturer, Vernon Jordan, on the subject of Black America Under Siege. Vernon. Thank you, Graham Allison. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be back at Harvard, especially to be at the Kennedy School and the Institute of Politics, where I spent some time in 1969 as a fellow, not amidst this opulence that we sit in here today, but right around the corner at 78 Mount Auburn uh, in that old yellow house, and it was nice and warm. And uh, 
as this is, I love. It's not going to hurt. <laughs> but I did, uh, I did have a great time here as a fellow. I made many friends, many of whom I've seen tonight. Dick Neustadt, who took good care of me when he directed the Institute of Politics. Jim and Betty Vornberg, and Ken and Carol Andrews, and, and numerous other friends. I'm delighted to, to be here and delighted that uh, uh, I could spend time with the fellows of the Kennedy Institute. I have a thing that uh, fellows ought to spend a lot of time with students. And I spent a lot of time with students when I was here in 1969, which was a very interesting year. That was the year uh, that Mr. Pusey sent for the Cambridge College. Most of you would not remember that, but some of you do. It was an interesting year, and uh, it was nice to be around uh, during that year uh, and to see so many of the things that I saw and to talk to students and learn as much as I did. So I do appreciate having the opportunity to uh, spend some time with the fellows, and I hope that the fellows will spend time with you as students and that you will spend time with the fellows. It is a great honor to be here to deliver the Pollock Lecture. The Pollock Lecture is an important forum for national and international issues and the John F. Kennedy School of Government is a basic institution for the study of political and governmental arts we will discuss here tonight. We have a unique practitioner of those political and governmental arts in the White House today, not since Franklin Delano Roosevelt has America been led by so gifted a communicator? Not since Lyndon Baines Johnson has America been led by so skillful a politician. And not since Herbert Hoover has America been led by a president so willing to sacrifice millions of people on the altar of an outmoded ideology arts of government and politics do not take place in a vacuum. They directly affect the lives of all of us, and they reach beyond our shores to affect people in distant lands. So admiration for this administration's success and the technical aspects of politics must be tempered by law at its economic and international policies at its devotion to a rigid ideology out of tune with the contemporary world and its virtual abandonment of compassion. The administration's domestic program is marked by sharp cuts in important social programs that provide sustenance for the poor and for people driven to the margins of our economy. It is marked by tax cuts tilted to the affluent and to business, including depreciation schedules that virtually wipe out taxation for many corporations. And it is marked by the abandonment of national programs and regulatory functions to the 50 states. Nearly 100 years ago, Grover Cleveland, a conservative president, wrote the following. He mocks the people who proposes that the government shall protect the rich and that they, in turn, will care for the laboring poor. President Cleveland knew that true conservatism seeks to preserve the best of the past. It seeks to keep what works and improve what can be improved. True conservatism includes compassion. Compassion, that is a key word this administration has removed from our political vocabulary. I'd like to discuss some aspects of this administration's policies tonight, and in particular how those policies affect government and the governed. But first, I'd like to place those remarks in context. America 
is a rich nation, an affluent nation. But the power it wields and the prestige it enjoys are only partially dependent upon its might and its wealth. From its earliest days, America has been a beacon of light in a dark world, a world that took hope from our Declaration of Independence, which says that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The core of the American Revolution spurred by the document was the promise of equality and the concept of democracy. Since then, those ideals first given reality in America have, have inspired people and nations all over the world as they continue to inspire us. But we have always been painfully aware of the gap between the promise of the Declaration and the reality of America's imperfect democracy, most clearly seen in the conditions afflicting black people and other minorities. That gap continues today, and it must be an integral part of any discussion of this administration's policy. There are today in America almost 30 million people officially classified as poor. And some estimates place the number at 60 million because the official poverty line grossly underestimates true hardship. There are today in America over 7 million people officially classified as unemployed. And if we add to them discouraged workers who have given up looking for non-existent jobs, part-time workers who want full-time work, we find some 15 million people unemployed or subemployed. That does not even include about 2 million people working full time for below poverty level wages. And the largest share of this burden has been borne by black Americans. A fourth of the black workforce is unemployed. Up to two thirds of black teenagers are jobless. A third of all black families are poor, and half of them don't get a single penny from welfare. And black family income is slipping only to a little more than half of white family income. And almost every measure of socioeconomic status, blacks lag behind whites, and in many instances, the gap is growing, not closing. Despite the administration's optimistic predictions about the economy, it is clear that unemployment and poverty will continue to remain at unconscionably high levels, especially among black people. That helps explain why the black community in America today feels itself under siege. It is victimized by the budget cuts it is harassed by tax on affirmative action. It is alarmed that state legislatures will redistrict our representatives out of the Congress and out of local office. It is outraged by the administration's tilt toward racist South Africa. It is threatened by a return to the discredited notion of states' rights. And it is burdened by events beyond the political arena by growing racial insensitivity and rising anti-black attitudes, by the continued deterioration of black neighborhoods, by the flow of drugs and the increase of crime, by the rise of fanatics on the far right like the Klan and the Nazis, the Klan meeting just this week in Connecticut in the North. The gains we made in the 60s were slowed in the 70s, and now in the 1980s, we face a massive attack on our basic interests. That attack is spearheaded by an administration whose policies are clearly hostile to black interests. It is an administration that delayed endorsing extension of the Voting Rights Act, reversed long-established judicial 
and administrative positions on desegregating the schools, proclaimed its hostility to the concept of affirmative action, weakened regulations enforcing the civil rights laws, and virtually excluded black people from key positions at the decision-making level, including those black people who took it on the chin to go into the black community during the campaign to say, vote for Reagan and Bush. Above all, it is an administration that has rammed through deep cuts in the social programs desperately needed by the poor. Just a brief look at some of those key programs that were slashed tell us that our leaders are busy drilling holes in the social safety net for the poor. Food stamps, cut. Medicaid, cut. Welfare, cut. Legal services, cut. Education aid, cut. Public service jobs, cut. The affluent got big tax cuts. The Pentagon got a blank check. When the poor got cuts in lifeline programs, cuts in programs that put food on their tables, cuts in programs that provide opportunities and hope. It is only in recent weeks that the true nature of those cuts has penetrated the public's conscience. It was public outrage that forced the administration to withdraw its plan to win the minimum Social Security benefit. It was public ridicule that forced the administration to withdraw school lunch regulations that defined ketchup as a vegetable and mandated smaller portions for hungry children. The administration says, of course, that its policies will result in economic growth that will create jobs for the poor. But those jobs lie in the distant future, even in the administration's own projections. What are poor people supposed to do until then? What help are jobs in 1986 if food stamps are cut in 1981? Why can't the administration respond to those who ask what they are supposed to do without jobs today, without the social programs they need today, without a compassionate government now? What are the 126 young black professionals that I laid off last week to do about work? 27 years old on the average, they make an average of $28,000 a year. They have a master's degree in something from somewhere. They have played the game by the rules. They made a choice at graduation to work for a voluntary nonprofit organization to help the least of these, their brothers and sisters. And today, they are out of work. They won't be picked up by the public sector. They won't be picked up by the private sector. What are they going to do in the interregnum? That does not even get to the question of those who are chronically unemployed, those who are structurally unemployed. That's a whole other group. What are they supposed to do in the interregnum? I find it strange that an administration that places so much emphasis on creating incentives for Americans to work more and save more, plans to reshape federal programs in a way that discourages poor people from working. In many instances, the working poor would be better off if they quit their low-paying jobs and became totally dependent. That way, they could retain eligibility for survival programs with the, which the administration's budget would disqualify them. It is important to remember that cuts in services and opportunity are coming at a time when the existing scale of safety net programs for the poor is inadequate. This is not because, as some would have it, people are too dependent on handouts from Washington, the changing nature of our economy, and the decline in job opportunities for the unskilled make more and more people marginal 
and unable to get by without help. They need the countervailing force of federal job, income, health, and other services that compensate for their exclusion from the market system. I fully recognize that some federal programs do not work well, that some have unintended negative side benefits. Many have been spread too thin to do much good. But most of the cuts have been targeted to programs that work and that work well. Food stamps, for example, have largely wiped out hunger in America. But food stamps were cut savagely because my conservative friends in the Senate stand up and evaluate the food stamp program by telling a story about some Harvard student who's the son of a banker getting food stamps. That is wrong and it should not happen, but that is not the measurement of the food stamp program. The measurement of the food stamp program are those black children and white children in Beaufort County, South Carolina, where McGovern and Kennedy went in 1968 and found them there with worms in their bellies. But because of the food stamp program, those young black and white children no longer have worms in their bellies, and that is the measurement of the school corruption of the food stamp program, not some Harvard student ineligibly receiving food stamps. Health among the poor has improved significantly, thanks to Medicaid, another program cut. The sharp decline in the elderly poor can be attributed to improvements in Social Security benefits, improvements that would be wiped out if Congress passes one of several short-sighted bills. A recent study found that black school achievement improved in the 70s and credited federally funded compensatory education programs for that improvement. Again, a successful program that will be cut. There are many other examples I could cite. All victims of a twisted logic that goes something like this. A problem has been solved by a government program. Therefore, since it is solved, we should do away with the program. Any moderately intelligent 10-year-old could carry that reasoning to its logical con conclusion that eliminating the program will bring the problem back in all its fury. So the problem is not, as the administration claims, that government programs have failed. They have not. It is their success that worry those who fear a society becoming more equal and more just. It is the success of federal programs, not their failure, that has sparked the counter-revolution of the right. And it is the full-scale attack on the programs that have brought opportunities and sustenance to poor people that has resulted in the wave of despair engulfing the black community. Perhaps, perhaps the most serious indictment of this administration's policy is that they have robbed poor people of hope. They have replaced cautious optimism with deep despair. When we hear our nation's leaders talk of getting government off our backs, we should be very clear about what they mean by that phrase, whose government, whose backs. It is tiresome to go over those endless numbers that show government is not larger or more onerous than in the past. The federal budget is roughly the same portion of the GNP as it has been since the war. The federal payroll is smaller than it was 30 years ago. The, three, the trillion dollar national debt the President always mentions is actually a smaller share of the GNP than in the past. Simplistic nostalgia is no substitute for an active, positive vision of America. 
I, for one, feel no nostalgia for the America that existed before government presumably leaped upon our backs. That was a time of denial of basic constitutional rights, legally enforced segregation, and a law of the jungle approach to social problems. It was a time of unbridled label exportation, racial injustice, consumer fraud, and other acts of moral violence. I testified last spring before a House committee considering extension of the Voting Rights Act. It was clear to me that some of those congressmen conceived of getting government off their backs by the process of removing federal oversight of election practices in states with a history of discrimination. And I knew that that committee would not be moved by facts and figures, and would not understand and did not want to understand facts and figures. They just wanted to get government off their backs. And so I told the committee the true story of a black man 92 years old, who on August 10th, 1965, seven days after the Voting Rights Act of 65 was passed in Marengo County, Alabama, Demopolis, Alabama, in the heart of the Black Belt. The registration process under the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was to start at 8.30. But at 6.30 in the morning, 200 black people were already in line. At 7.30, another 400 black people were already in line, hurrying to exercise a basic right that had been denied them for so long. When the office opened, some 600 black people in Demopolis, Alabama, Marengo County, were there to register. And in that line was this black gentleman, 92 years old, dressed up in his Sunday best, the creases in his face made it clear that he had a bachelor's degree from the College of Survival and a PhD from the University of Adversity. All of his experience was in his face. And when he reached the registration desk, the registrar from the U.S. Civil Service Commission said, you're a pretty old man. He said, yes, I'm 92 years old. He said, what took you so long to come here to register to vote? And the old man, with the wisdom peculiar to the black experience, said to the registrar, I never came before because all my life I've had a philosophy to never get in the way of trouble or coming. If you know anything about the South, you know what he meant by trouble or coming <laughs> if you dared register to vote. And then the registrar said to him, if your philosophy has been all your life to never get in the way of trouble or coming, why are you here today? And the old man responded by saying, I'm here today because trouble ain't a coming like it used to did. It will take more persuasive powers than even a communicator like Ronald Reagan possesses to convince that old man that government is on his back. Not long ago, I found myself in a conversation with a man, a white man, sitting next to me on a flight from New York to Los Angeles. And he knew who I was, and after his first martini, 
took the occasion to lecture me eloquently on how wrong I was and what I was saying and to speak emotionally about the government's intrusion into his life and into his business. But after the third martini, I began to ask some questions. And what was revealed was interesting. It turned out that my seatmate started his business with an SBA loan. He got his education under the GI Bill. He lived in a suburb made possible by federal highway money and subsidized by federal sewage grants. His home was bought with the help of an FHA mortgage. His parents were no burden to him thanks to Social Security and Medicare, and his children were in college on federal merit scholarships. Martin is a hell of a thing. The government programs he condemned were the means by which he climbed into the middle class and prospered. Reminds me of that passage of scripture which says, to those who have, to them shall be given. To those who have not even that which they seem to have shall be taken away. Now that it's our time, he's saying, that we are intruding government upon his life and upon his business. His selfish meanness now appears to have been elevated into a new national philosophy reflected by the current administration. It is a philosophy at odds with the dominant current of great equality and social justice that has made America great. And it is a philosophy that leads to widening the gap between those who have so much and those who have so little. But those who sow greater inequality may weep the whirlwind. They feed the terrible anger, alienation, and bitterness that are so prevalent in our society by ignoring the interest of the bottom half. They risk all. When Miami blew up a year or so ago, I got a call from a friend of mine who told me that people were acting crazy in Miami. And I immediately recalled some lines from the great black poet Les Langston Hughes who wrote, seems like what makes me crazy has no effect on you. I'm gonna keep on doing until you are crazy too. When people are deprived of a stake in a society, you cannot not expect them to act in ways society approves. When people are subjected to racism, to joblessness, and to unequal justice, you cannot expect them to act as if they have good jobs, decent homes, and respect for the authority. This is central to my theme. Well, I believe we must construct a vision of America that will bind all our people together rather than drive them further into selfish privatism. I believe in a vision of America that is an open, pluralistic, integrated society. For a brief time in the mid-60s, that vision was dominant. People felt good about themselves and about their country. Wrongs were being righted. Long-standing injustices were being eliminated. It was a brief moment, but a golden moment in America. I suggest to you that the drive for civil rights was behind that positive, optimistic outlook. The black surge for freedom and justice spilled over into other areas and to economic policies attacking poverty, and to education policies that gave poor children a head start, and to health policies that gave poor people access to health care. It was a time when America agreed with Lyndon Johnson when he said at Harvard University, 
To be black in a white society is not to stand on level and equal ground. While the races may stand side by side, whites stand on history's mountain and blacks stand in history's hollow. Until we overcome unequal history, we cannot overcome unequal opportunity. So I suggest to you that a society that directs its energies to social justice, that devotes itself to caring concern for the least of its citizens, and that demonstrates respect for life by trying to make all lives meaningful would be a society that has a better chance to escape the destructive pattern in which we seem trapped today. The market system will work to the degree that all participate in it. The economic system will work to the degree that all are given opportunities to work. The social system will survive to the degree that all are treated with humane respect and concern. I find it hard to understand why public and private sector leadership does not understand this. The President has given the nation leadership of one kind, but I ask, where is the depth of leadership that speaks for equality and justice? Black leadership has been outspoken, but much of white leadership has been silent. Black leadership has been criticized for the failure to produce victories, but the failure to produce victories is an indictment of white leadership not black leadership, for it is white leadership whose hands are on the levers of our society. It is white leadership who control the vast resources of the world's richest nation. It is white leadership that has failed to bring its followers in the public sector and the private sector along the road laid down by a Bible that says, let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream and a constitution that says equal protection under the law belongs to everybody. It is white leadership, not black leadership, that controls a $3 trillion economy and a $700 billion federal budget. It is white leadership, not black leadership, that brutally cuts poor people's program to get money to build MX missiles. It is the failure of white leadership that puts our nation's economy in peril and endangers its moral standing. Black people don't run International Harvest and black people don't run Chrysler. It is the failure of white leadership that makes it imperative for black people to make our needs heard, to fight for our rights, and to keep our cause before an uncaring nation. And it is the failure of white leadership that demands from white students a renewed commitment and activism of the kind displayed in the 1960s. It was the fervor of a young generation swept by ideals of equality that helped push the white leadership of our society to take those important first steps to a better society. And it is the complacency of today's white students that encourages today's white leadership and its efforts to roll back the gains of the 60s. So today's students, so today's students, white and black, are challenged to recover the moral fervor, to renew their commitment to those trapped by poverty and despair, to assert their young and creative leadership. It is up to today's students, I believe, to prove that they are not the selfish career, seeker, career, sickest, career seekers that are made out to be by the media reports that cheer the return of the silent 50s on campus. Student activism splintered in the 70s saving whales and fighting deans became more important than saving hungry children or fighting racism. But in the 60s, 
It was the students, black and white, who registered black people to vote in the meanest southern district, who tutored ghetto kids, and who fought slum conditions. It is that kind of moral commitment we are looking for and need today, a commitment to building a moral society. For make no mistake about it, the struggle for equality for blacks, browns, women, is a moral struggle. When a third of the poor are drawn from a tenth of the nation, that's a moral issue. When a third of the jobless are drawn from the tenth of the population, that's a moral issue. When public and private policies strangle the cities in which the majority of blacks live, that's a moral issue. When a nation that subjected black people first to slavery, then to persistent oppression, and now subjects them to disproportionate disadvantage, I say that's a moral issue. And it is a moral issue when people label limited affirmative action to help blacks overcome past and present discriminatory practices as reverse discrimination. Every statistic, <laughs> every statistic in any field shows continued white advantage. <coughs> and I ask, where is this reverse discrimination in an economy where blacks with some college have the same unemployment rates as white high school dropouts? Where is this reverse discrimination where blacks with some high school education have double the unemployment rates of white people who never got past elementary school? It's a moral issue when welfare is labeled a black program while the majority of welfare recipients are white people. It's a moral issue when every halting step of black progress is fought, when policies that would perpetuate a system that locks blacks into the bottom of our society are proposed. And it is that moral fact that continues to distinguish the civil rights movement. It is that moral factor so many people refuse to acknowledge today. But I say to you that if desegregation was right, in 1954, it is right today. If Martin King's dream of brotherhood and justice was right in 1963, it is right today. If the war on poverty was right in 1964, it is right today. Truth and justice cannot be erased from the moral map of America's soul. We cannot evade our personal responsibility do everything in our power to right the wrongs of the past and the present. So I'm here to say that the moral banner is still unfurled. It waves high above the current struggle. The issues are more complex, the resistance more entrenched. But the civil rights movement is still about the business of bringing America's minorities into the mainstream of our national life with all of the rewards and responsibilities others take for granted. It is fitting in an institution that bears the name of John F. Kennedy that I remind those whose concerns are directed away from the needs of America's poor that it was President Kennedy who said, if a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. And it is fitting, too, that in calling upon you to bear responsibility for helping the many who are poor and dispossessed, I remind you of the words of Robert Kennedy, who wrote, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring,
These ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I believe for today's students, I believe for black people, I believe for caring white people, I believe for conservatives who have some compassion, this to be our charge to keep our calling to fulfill our rendezvous with destiny. And to that end, may we neither stumble nor falter. Rather, let us mount up with wings as eagles. Let us run and not be weary. Let us walk together, children, and not faint. Thank you, and God bless you all. Vernon has consented to uh, take a couple of questions, and so if you would raise your hand, put your question succinctly, and then we'll let Vernon have a chance to answer it. Yes, sir. Yeah, because I don't believe I'm indispensable to that struggle. your first question, or your statement first. My answer to your statement is that we disagree, uh, pure and simple. Uh, secondly, I think for black people that it is, as I tried to say at the Urban League Conference this summer, that it's back to basics. It's back to nurturing community strengths. It's back to the simple, hard process of registration and voting and turning out to vote. It is back to trying to create new alliances and new coalitions. Uh, it is back to protest. It is back to exerting power wherever we can in maximum ways. I believe that is for black people. For liberals, I think they really got to examine what they believe and how well they believe it. Liberals do not lose very well. They do not know how to act in defeat, and they do not know what to do when they're out of office. Um, uh, the, um, the fight that the Democratic Party put up against the budget cuts and the tax cuts remind me of my, uh, my walk around the reservoir in New York City. I, I don't run. Most of the people run. I walk. But when I get within 50 yards of where I started, I run like hell for the last 50 yards. So it looks like a fantastic finish. <laughs> and that's the way uh, the congressman from the state and other of his Democratic counterparts look. And I think that a party that does not know how to oppose is not worthy of governance. So I think that the party out of power has got to get itself together and to deal creatively with the new reality rather than buckle under and try to ascertain where the people are and then come up with some kind of, some kind of program. I think
think, thirdly, that the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, the party that freed the slaves, the party for which black people voted up until 1932, and given a, a, a good choice, will vote for now, is missing out on a fantastic opportunity to make us truly a two-party people, even with this administration. And it just seems to me that that sound political strategy would suggest that they ought to have a work at getting many of us on our side. The, the 1980 election was an express train. Most of them are locals. And when they're locals, it is true that axiom that says the black vote giveth and the black vote taketh away. And so the next one might be a local. The 1982 congressional election might be local. We might, if we get them out and get them to the polls, make the difference. And so it seems to me that there ought to be some conscious awareness of that uh, in the GOP to try to take this opportunity of incumbency and, and, and recruit blacks at all levels of the party. I was not being uh, cavalier with you, sir. I was being honest. I do not believe that I'm indispensable. I've also been doing it for 10 years. It's a great job. It's a, the best job in black America. It's one of the best jobs in America. And I think it ought to be shared. Somebody else ought to come sit where I sit, see what I've seen, do what I do, so we can pass it on. We don't have much of this. And I want to pass it on. <laughs> Well, I think if you look at most of the programs that I'm screaming about in a former part of my presentation, those are not programs for middle-class black people who are students at Harvard. <laughs> they are programs for black people who are just the kind of people that Bill Wilson is talking about. Food stamp, that's not a middle-class program. Medicaid, that's not a black middle-class program. Uh, I could go on and on. Those are the CETA, they're not give jobs to middle-class black people. Wait a minute, let me just finish. Is all right? <laughs> okay. Um, secondly, there is no question but that when you graduate from Harvard, you're going to have a better shot at, e shot at economic security than the buddy that you left on the corner in your community. I mean, that's just a fact of life. Uh, uh, now, to that, that is the person that I believe that we have to get to and serve. And these are the people that were being served by this program. These are the people that are being most jostled by this program. Not us, not me and you, but the brothers and sisters back home. They're the ones who are in trouble. I also think Bill Wilson is making the other point that uh, the issue is class and not race. And I think that uh, with all due respect to my friend, who's the chairman of the advisory committee of the Chicago Research Urban, Urban Chicago Urban League Research Program, I think he's wrong. It's still race. It's still this. It's still last. And uh, I don't think it's class. And it is true that to the extent that we gain the right to check into the downtown motel, that that right is a hollow right until you have somehow gotten a wherewithal to check out of it. <laughs> and, <coughs> and so... <coughs> <laughs> and so I, I'm leery of, of all of my friends in academia who want to start out creating a chasm between what black people have squeezed out of the situation and those who got trapped in it. We are bound by an inescapable tie, and that is our black. We all got kinfolk on welfare, need food stamps, on Medicaid, and how to work. And, and so that, it seems to me, is a glue to keep us together. And I think some of my black academic friends.
friends have done us a disservice. I think some of the black conservatives have done us a disservice and said affirmative action is not a good thing for poor people. I don't understand what they're talking about. I, I hope that's the answer to your question. That's all right. Yes, I, yeah, I am saying to you that the 126 black middle class kids that I laid off last week are harshly affected by the Reagan program. They're out of work. I don't know how you measure affectation. I really appreciate your reference to all of those academic journals, but I, I you know, and I, I read them, but they, they don't help. I'm for that. I agree with you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah, I was, um, when I said black people, I was including black women. I'm be, I'm, I really was including <laughs> black women. I also, uh, yeah, I also was not including white women, but that's another <laughs> situation. Big Pond, we do have a, we, yeah, we do have a coalition. I do have a difficult time with, with white women who march for ERA and who march against school desegregation. I have a hell of a problem with that. And so that's, that's, that's a little problem. And I have some problem with those who are, who are um, against abortion but for the death penalty. I have a lot of problem with that. Um, so, um, and I do think that there are, there are some collision courses on which white women and black and white men are on in the personnel office, which is manned by white people. And given the option, I can tell you what's going to happen nine times out of ten. And I won't get the job, and she won't get it. <laughs> yeah, so, so th th there are opportunities <laughs> for coalition. I made some reference to that. Uh, the question basically is the extent to what the redistricting process that is going on in state legislatures uh, is in fact racist and will in fact uh, uh, rid black people and other minorities of political representation that they presently have. 
there are two sides of this year in Georgia they're trying to draw a district for a black and other places they're trying to uh, uh, draw the lines in such a way so as to take the district uh, away from blacks it is probably a more political fight than it is a racial fight uh, but I think that you have to be on guard you have to watch it and you have to be careful of it and you it, it's it's important that those blacks in the state legislatures do the kind of bargaining and uh, swapping and dealing so as to secure uh, that which we already have and to the extent possible to get some more. That is not unrelated, on the other hand, to the extent to which blacks in local communities exert themselves with their state representative in the state legislature about what they ought to do in the redistricting process. Yes, sir. I don't think I want to answer that. Uh, I think, first of all, you ought to understand what it is and, uh, and read all of my friends' books over there. <laughs> and uh, uh, and I think that it's probably as, if you disagree with it, somehow that disagreement has to be voiced, exhibited. We've got to understand what you, in fact, think about it. Uh, the problem is, is that most people on this campus are not directly affected by it. Uh, there are many kids who couldn't come to school this year who are affected by it. Uh, and those 800,000 people who, before October 1st, had seated jobs no longer have, uh, no longer have seated jobs. A million families that were getting food stamps no longer have food stamps. And as I said in my talk, some, some people, for some people, it will really, they will lose because they make, they sort of call it poor plus one, that's what the Washington Post calls it. The poor plus one, they are working, and they're the working pool, but they get supplemental benefits, food stamps and Medicaid. They no longer get those supplemental benefits, and if you compare what they make now to what they would get if they went on welfare, it's almost comparable to the point that they might be better off doing, doing the other. Now that is the situation. My experience has been that students are so creative and uh, have such initiative and uh, so to influence foreign policy decisions, especially as it relates to South Africa. My first answer to that is that I am interested in trying to influence all foreign policy. And I'm especially interested in it now as jobs will begin to go to the Far East because the wages are so low, and when the jobs go to the Far East because of low wages, that means a lot of us will be out of work. So that's a big foreign policy issue, protectionism, all of that. Uh, uh, I'm on my way to Poland and Moscow this week, and so I got a great interest in that the Russians are circling the wagons around Poland because I know who's going to go first and who's going to do most of the dying. If Vietnam is an example, so I. So I am not interested just in Africa. Now, on South Africa, I think that the government's new position of neutrality on apartheid is offends the basic notion of what this democracy is all about. And uh, all of us in the black leadership have spoken out about it. Now, there is a division in black leadership that I will constantly acknowledge on one area is disinvestment policies by American companies. I happen to be very honestly on the side of those opposed to disinvestment policies by American companies, or disinvestment by American companies in South Africa. That is, a, that is not a new position for me. It is, it is a consistent one, and I do not retrench from it, although I understand the other position. Uh, my morality is such that I am not prepared to make a moral judgment about the condition of poor black people in Soweto by going to a corporate board meeting and voting that person out of work by counseling disinvestment policy. There are some people who, whose morality is such that they can do that with ease. I cannot. 
and when I was in Soweto in 1976 and presented certificates to young, four young black men in Soweto who had completed a course in electromagnetic dynamics that would not have been taught to them in the Bantu schools. I am not quite prepared to support a policy of, of, of disinvestment because I have some notion that if you got a job, your, your intensity to do away with apartheid is greater uh, than if you don't have a job and if, you're, if, if, if you are just half hungry rather than totally hungry, you can fight a better fight for freedom. Thank you so much. It's been a joy being here.